the weekly show with David J. Maloney. This week, David chats with the renowned screenwriter James V. Hart. And now, here's your host, David J. Maloney. Welcome, everyone, to The Weekly Show. I'm your host, David G. Maloney. Tonight, we have the next part of our interview with screenwriter James V. Hart. Uh, James's work on the silver screen has been responsible for some of the most beloved classics of the 80s and 90s, from Steven Spielberg's Hook to Muppet Treasure Island to Bram Stoker's Dracula and the Robert Zemeckis film Contact. He's worked with some of the best and brightest minds of cinema. Uh, back with us again tonight to chat about his incredible career and his movies we all love is none other than screenwriter James V. Hart. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. I want to talk about Bram Stoker's Dracula that you worked on with Francis Ford Coppola. And what's interesting is this is another case where film to film and script to script, your genre and tone changed almost completely. <laughs> I mean, there's obviously some similarities in the fantasy of both stories, but also very, you know, very different tones. What was it like working on those? I mean, you, you were working on them seemingly at the same time. Well, it is interesting because it is, a, it is a, they're both about um, eternal life. They're both about wanting to live forever. And you'll see that in a lot of my stuff is that thematically that, that is, is what is eternal life all is cracked up to be, you know? Um, um, I still, and when I watch Dracula, which I do, we do use it in, in my workshops, uh, I often say to myself, how, would, how did I get into that zone and how can I get back there? Because it was a great zone to be in. One, you had that great novel, you had Stoker's novel that, that nobody had ever done. Mm -hmm. They they just cast the novel aside. So with, um, and Hook had some darker moments in it that were smoothed out. Um, Dracula came out of the blue, and it turns out that Dracula was something that uh, I was more ready to write as a writer and it more challenged by it. And I needed a darker, I needed, as, as Kathy Kennedy said, oh, oh, now we know the dark side of you. You know, uh, Dracula was a much darker, but also a great love story. And um, I think not having that Hook is about loving your family, you know, and about capturing your, your childhood, recapturing your childhood and being the, finding that kid inside you again, that the child inside you. Dracula is about loss and redemption and um, uh, fall is falling from grace and being uh, resurrected. Um, and it's also about the power of love. Just saying that the tones are completely different. So you can't inject the kind of humor into Dracula that you would rely on and hook. So I couldn't write a funny scene between Dracula and, and Harker, between Keanu and, and, and Gary. I couldn't write a funny scene between Gary and Winona. There was no comic relief except for maybe Sir Anthony in that, in that film. Uh, and also uh, Francis said a wonderful because I wrote both those scripts without those directors involved. Francis read Dracula, Stephen read Hook. They didn't. They didn't exist in their in their playing field or in their radar, and they kind of blindsided both of them. Um, and I think because they were so different worlds, I had to. When I was down the rabbit hole on Dracula, I didn't want to be pulled out to go deal with Hook. And fortunately, Hook went forward while I was still working on Dracula, and it was in production, uh, and I didn't have to worry about it. I mean, I, I would see dailies, but it let me compartmentalize and ship, put, you know, put that Dracula helmet on and stuff there, that Dracula helmet on and go down the, and go down into, into that world and stay there. And you were nominated for a Hugo Award for the screenplay of that film. Where does that script stack up for you in your CV? I mean, what was your, what was your favorite part about writing that story? Well, the favorite part was working with Francis because Francis is a writer first. Uh, and he knows how hard it is to get those words on the page. And he, he knew how hard it was to find a way to adapt that book because that would have been one of his favorite books as a camp counselor. Um, so it was being able to have conversations with Francis knowing I'm talking to a writer and a writer is talking back to me. 
And he would he would say he I think he said you can you can be a good director without being a writer, but you'll never be a great director unless you're first a good writer. Um, so you understand you understand the 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 mechanics of storytelling, and you understand the mechanics of 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 um, of character. You understand that the importance of character. The character drives the story. Uh, and also, getting to see the cast bring that film to life. Getting to watch uh, Gary and and Francis butt heads, and getting to watch Winona and 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 Sadie Frost, who was incredible. Getting to watch Sir Anthony, they all loved the script. They actually defended the script. When Francis would want to make cuts or something or take a scene out, they'd go, "No, no, 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 no. Uh, please don't cut that out." Um, uh, and and I think that to me was the was the joy of it is that they really, really appreciated the writing. Whereas on Hook, you're changing and you're changing lines every day and you're changing your, your, your stuff being changed on the set and what have you, which is fine. I don't mind that. But what I loved about Francis is that he said, this is the script we're shooting. He storyboarded it where on the, he called it the score on one side of the page was the actual shot storyboards that Peter Ramsey did the other side was was my screenplay my shooting script not just there's a whole wall of storyboards it was right there so you could open it up and look at it if you didn't matter what department you were in you could see what you were shooting that day what the requirements were uh and it was fascinating because he he I learned so much about prep and prep preparing and how the value of preparation and that's what I do on my scripts now I took all, everything I learned from Francis Writing a script has pre-production that goes into writing the script. And that's sort of my method now. It's called a heart chart. And uh, it all came from my my work with him. It was a joy to watch this man defy the studio, be fearless in his in his courage about defending the the artistic integrity of the piece, never never wanting to give up or, or toss in the towel even when he didn't like the movie. You know, uh, uh, that was, uh, I, don't, I don't know if, I, I haven't had that experience since, and I'm not sure I ever will. Well, he's but a guy who fought, uh, had to fight his whole way through with the Godfather, so. Exactly, there he were told tons me those of stories. There tons he of told battles there, tons of me those stories. Yeah. yeah. He, would, he said, I had to fire somebody at the end of every week so they wouldn't fire me. <laughs> you know, uh, and that whole thing about the chaos that he creates on set, like in, in Apocalypse Now, that's his method. That's how he gets back in control. We had his... We had an instance like that on Dracula when we were in three days from shooting. We're in rehearsal at that famous church there on Highland and Franklin. Uh, uh, so it's got a big gymnasium. A lot of people go there to rehearse. And my ball house has got a high eight camera. He's filming the rehearsals and we're working and you know, you're using doll furniture and stuff, you know, and um, and Gary is doing the scene where he brings Winona to his chest and she drinks the blood and they all rush in with their stuff and he stands up and and he's there giving the lines as they come in and he's standing up in the bed and, and he finally just stops and says, Francis, I can't do this scene. I can't do it. And Francis is going, what do you mean you can't do it? This is every line that you asked to be in here, all of you, that you, the scene is exactly what you wanted to do. What do you mean you can't do it? And he said, well, they're coming in here with all their, their potions and their crucifixes and their guns and silver bullets and acid. I'm standing here in my underwear delivering these lines, you know, because they've been in bed. Uh, and, you, and, and he said, I can't do it. Uh, I, I feel stupid. You know, I'm naked. And Francis said, OK, um, here's what we're going to do. Jim, you take everybody around the little petition to lunch. You guys reread the scene and you get the scene right. And then I'll decide whether or not we're going to shoot this movie. And everybody goes, whoa. And, and me, I'm going, uh, uh, they're all looking at me, you know. Uh, okay, let's all go do what Francis he just goes, said. He just goes all in. And, and I got everybody around the corner. We sat down to eat and all of a sudden we hear all this noise crashes and chairs and tables being right and turning on again, you know, and I go running out around the corner and, and I see Francis disappearing out the back door with his little beret. He's turned over the tables. He's turned over the chairs. He's thrown coffee everywhere. I mean, he's totally trashed the set. 
And I got Anthony Hopkins, I got Richard Grant, I got uh, Gary Ullman, I got another writer, I got you know, all standing there looking at me going, what the Oh, heck? no. <laughs> you know? And Anahid Nazarian is sitting there. His, she, his, she's been with Francis, for, she's now his producer forever. She was had a PhD in library science. So she had typed, I never typed the script after we, she would type everything. And then I would look over her shoulder and we'd edit. And she was standing there very demure with a notebook in her hand. And she said, Francis would like all of you to go home or to your, to your hotel or wherever you stay and wait. And he'll let you know if we're going to make this movie starting Monday or Tuesday. Now, this is before cell phones. You know, we're so we're going to to sit by the phone. And so, but in a matter of minutes, the word was all over town that Francis had lost it and was pulling the plug on the movie. And there were people calling their agents going, what the hell would you, you know? And on he says, everybody but you, Jim, you stay. And to make a really interesting story this long, I'll make it shorter. Uh, Francis wanted me, she said, you're going to have a plane ticket tonight and you're going to go to Reno in the morning and you're going to spend the weekend with Francis. He likes to go there when he did it with the Godfather and for the last weekend before he starts shooting to work on the script. So at midnight, uh, I get a knock on the, our hotel door. My wife's asleep. And uh, there's the airline ticket from uh, one of the assistants. Um, and uh, also a brown envelope with a VHS cassette in it. And it's the rough cut of Ellie Coppola's documentary on the making of Apocalypse Now. Still has the time code on it. With a note that says, watch this before you meet Francis. So I put I put it on right there, you know, in the room, and I watch it. And there is that moment in in Apocalypse Now where he blows up. And he throw, he tells Martin Sheen, you're not dead till I say you're dead. You know, I mean, he totally, and I watched the artist at work. And I was being tipped off. This is his method. I was still afraid, but I at least understood the purpose of his action. And I'll be quick. Anyway, I go to the hotel. I've got a huge room. He calls me and said, do you like your room? Yeah. Do you want a bigger room? No, I got it. The room is fine. You sure? No, no, it's fine. He said, well, I'll come down and see you in a few, in, a, in about 30 minutes. We'll talk. I hang up the phone and there's a click on my door. He's got the key to my room. He opens the door and he stands in the doorway, but he doesn't enter. He just stands in the doorway. You know, and he looks and he leans in and says, I can get you a bigger room. And I no, 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 Francis, then I'm fine. He will not enter the room because in order for Dracula to be allowed to come into the room, he has to be invited. And he's playing this game with me. And so I'm we're about 20 feet apart. I'm sitting at the bar with my big giant computer, and he's in, and we start talking. And he finally says, Um, what if Dracula turns into a big bat? And I'm going, this has been a running argument we've had, not with each other, but the whole idea of, of Dracula turning into a bat suddenly went camp. Everything in the film up until that point had been right out of the book. But to see him turn into a bat and fly out the window, we've lost the audience. It's then we're back in Campville. And I said, how big? Like a 747? He said, no, a big bat. You know, and he said, and he, and I said, Well, you what does it look like? And he said, Well, what does a vampire see when he looks in the mirror? That was a good question. And I said, we don't see anything, but the vampire sees the tormented soul. That they, that's why they don't like them because they see the thing they have turned into. He said, that's what we're. That's that's the bat we're going to do. I said, great idea. So I'm glad you approve. And he took he took this big mold that that Greg Canham had done of the bat of the Gary bat that we see in the love scene. And he had figured all, he already said, it's good to go. I've already got this figured out. You know, he'd already done it. I got the costume. I got the mold. So now when you see the scene in the film where she's drinking the blood and they come in and he turns out to be this thing, he delivers the same line. Says not one line has been changed. Not one line was changed in the scene except for one that he wrote. And when I get to the set that day to watch him shoot, he's in the outfit. And he said, Jim, I got a surprise for you. I got. I came up with a line. I want. I want to try it out and see what they think in the take. And I'm going, great, Gary. You look good. You know, 
And there it is when he stands up in the bed and he says, look what your God has done to me. I didn't write that line. And I'm going, whoa. The actor in the costume, in the moment, in front of the cameras with all the actors there, the director, everybody else, came up with the, the line that is the line that is the essence of the character. Take two. You want to see me do it again? What do you think? What do you and I and and that I mean that's the kind of experience I had on this movie. Yeah. Uh from one from one genius to another. I mean just genius and bold and courageous. Yeah. We find ourselves at the creation of your script for Muppet Treasure Island. And and yeah. you told my assistant producer this is probably your favorite job you've ever had writing the script for this movie. So I'm excited to talk to you about it. First, how did how did that job even come about? I know it's crazy. Um uh because of Hook, uh, I got to meet uh, uh Brian Henson. Mm -hmm. I was a big Muppet fan, and because of all this stuff we were doing, and uh Disney was about to pull the plug on Muppet Treasure Island. And Brian called me and said, listen, I, you know, because everybody, I'd done pirates and hook and all that stuff. He said, can you, can you maybe consider, read the script and consider coming on because they're about to cancel it, you know, and they were close to building sets and, you know, and they'd spent all this time on it. Jerry Jewell was still alive. Um, and the problem was, is that Frank Oz did not want to work with kid actors. He would only work with Muppets, even though he had eight children. He did not want to work with with a child actor playing playing uh, Jim Hawkins. So I read the script and I said, "Yeah, you." And and, the, and that script, uh, Gonzo and Rizzo were Jim and Hawkins. <laughs> there were John Long, John Silver was not even a, uh, an actor. They were all Muppets. So I said, "If you don't if you don't have two humans in this, if you don't have Long John Silver and Jim playing humans, you're gonna you're you're gonna lose the audience." You know, it's, it's not Muppets Take Manhattan or, you know, it, it, the success of their first one was they had human actors also interacting with. Them. So I wrote a couple of scenes. Go so it. we huddled there. We huddled there for four or five days. Brian would come over, Alex Rockwell. We were all. And so I wrote a few scenes and they gave the scenes to Frank Oz because he's the one we had to convince. Frank read the scenes and went, these are great. Can we have more of them? This is what we need. So he agreed to come off of his position and I will not work with child actors. Um, and uh, Disney read the script and, and greenlit it uh, instead of pulling the plug. Um, but, and, and working with, working with them, working with Frank and working with Brian, just the, and the whole Muppet crew, you realize that you're work, you're dealing with a historical, they're like an archeological dig. I mean, we were trying to find a role to cast for Kermit. And Brian would say, nah, Kermit would never play that part. That's not, that's not, that's not Kermit. He's not gonna, they're not going to do good in that role. And um, we couldn't find a part for Miss Piggy. You know, literally you were casting movie stars. You know, it's like Humphrey Bogart is going to play, you know, uh, a clown in a circus or something. It just, you know, it doesn't work. Um, so that was the big lesson for me. And, uh, and as I got to meet all of them, uh, the guy who was playing, because Jim was dead by that point, Steve Whitmire was playing Kermit. You literally had to, you had to deal with them as entities that were alive. Mm -hmm. uh, once Frank Oz put his hand up Miss Piggy's skirt, he's Miss Piggy. And he stays Miss Piggy in between takes. You know, that's who wrote this. Whoops. Shit. I think a better line. Um, um, and you would get that all the time. Uh, and that's how they would talk to Brian when he was directing. They would talk to him in character. The table read uh, at the studio in, in, in England was phenomenal. It was all of these great Muppet performers uh, that I had such respect for. Uh, and the set was so much fun. Uh, they all love what they're doing. And I took my kids. Jake and Julia had been on the hook set, Dracula set. And they were huge Muppet fans. And I took them, we went there several days and we made the mistake of sticking around after they shut down and we're leaving. And Julia, who was then I think nine, walks by the cart and all the Muppets are hanging on their posts, you know? Yeah. And their eyes, and suddenly they look there and she went, oh my God, they're dead. You know? And 
it was a it was a wonderful experience and it was just a, there was just a joy they loved going to work all the crew all the muppet performers you know that ah, you know you didn't have any of that bull- whoops you have a lot of sets between actors and what have you um it was phenomenal and uh it was i think it was the most joyous set i have ever been on and probably will ever be on again yeah was there really any spectacular was there any story element that got cut from the script that you still think would have been just an absolute riot to see on screen? You know, that's a good question. I, I spent a lot of time in the editing room. Brian let me go into the editing room, which is my favorite place to be. Uh, that's a good question. I do know we had to we had to take things of Miss Piggy out that were too risque. We had to change dialogue. We had adults complaining in screenings. I know we had to take a couple of, a couple of her bits out uh, and change some of her dialogue. Um, uh, I think Frank was having way too much fun with, with her being marooned on an Island and, and having, uh, cohabitation with, with silver and anybody else, any other pirate that showed up. Um, she was a bit of a pig, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, but now in terms of set, Oh, I know what it was. Yes. We had all these bits in the second act to get you from when they set sail to the, they got the treasure Island. And we came up with, okay, we'll stretch guns on a rack. We'll do all the, you know, we had all these bits and we shot some of them. And the most boring part of any of these pirate movies is the voyage from here to there. Because what are you going to do? You get sick, fight a giant squid. You got to, you have to come up with stuff. So Brian solved it with a song. Um, uh, uh, Cabin Fever. So in the middle of the movie, and and it was this great the couple who wrote the the songs. Oh, they wrote everything up on the roof, everything. Um, they wrote this song, Cabin Fever. So in the middle of the movie, there's this ridiculous song that comes out of nowhere, where everybody goes, "I got it too, Cabin Fever," you know. And mm-hmm. then when the song is over, everybody looks at the camera, and goes, ah, "Land ho!" You know. And there's the tre- there's Treasure Island. So we there was a bunch of stuff that was shot to fill up that space that was cut out. Do I think it was better than Cabin Fever? No. Cabin Fever is still one of the best script solutions I've ever seen to a second act problem. Because yeah. uh, you once you finish the song, you're there. It's like, boom, yeah. yeah. That's funny. Treasure um, Island. How early was Tim Curry attached to the film? I mean, was it before you were finished writing or after? I'm kind of curious if you knowing it was going to be him playing the role of Long John Silver would have aided or molded your writing of that character. I th- I know that Brian had him in his mind early on. Um, I try not to let actors inform. I mean, I, I, what I'm writing, I try to write the character. Um, the only time I ever broke that rule was when it was took. I wrote, I wrote P- Peter for Dustin Hoffman. I mean, for, for uh, Robin Williams, Robin was the only person in my view that could ever play that part. If you couldn't get Robin, don't do it. But no, I know Tim was, he was on he was on on Brian's radar very early on. So but I just wrote I wrote I mean, I've grown up with Long John Silver. He's one of my favorite villains, you know. Um I didn't need an actor to inspire me. Um I didn't write Captain Hook for Dustin Hoffman. Uh Mike Dust my Captain Hook was Daniel Day Lewis in um Last of the Mohicans. That would have been a different hook. That's what I wrote. So but I try not to do that. Uh, but Tim was incredible. Totally into it. He's a, a wonderful music man. And uh, it was the right tone for Silver in a kid's, you know, in a, in a Muppet treatment of, of a, a Treasure Island. That is our show for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. A special thanks to James V. Hart for joining us. James will be back again next week. So please tune back in. Stay safe, everyone. Mm-hmm.